Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I guess we should get started, seeing as it's about five after, and we do have a presentation today to get through, and quite a few other things. So, thanks to everybody for coming out on a Saturday afternoon, just before school starts. Busy, busy time of year, we know, and um, we've got lots of things to uh, talk about today. We have Jim Moore from Nature Conservancy giving a presentation on, on solar developments. Um, we also have our usual what's been happening and what's coming up. Kathy's giving her August care tips. We have our 15 minute refreshment break and thanks to Earl and Dominique for bringing in the, the food this time for us. Um, do we have any new adopters here today? I know it seems to be mostly people that, that would be at every meeting, so I guess we don't need to really worry too much about new adopters because everybody here is, is a familiar face. Um, if you do have any questions about adoptions, then Janina is here, our adoption coordinator. Um, and if you do have any stories that you want to share with us, feel, feel free to do so. Um, we have some interesting things that we've been doing lately. I see a lot of people here who are helping out with the Mega Diet Bagging, which we did last week. Unfortunately, the Guinness Book of World Records doesn't have a section for Mega Diet Bagging, but if it did, we would have broken the record last week because it was, it was fast. I think about 45 minutes to an hour, we were done in under an hour. So uh, thanks to everybody that helped. A ton and a half of Mega Diet in about 45 minutes. And thanks to Nancy for uh, Nancy Thompson Jones for for helping out with with setting us up with the location. It was a great location, and we got everything done extremely quickly. I, I must, if there was an award for the worst station, I think I would have won that one because it was it was pretty bad the floor afterwards. But but we got it all cleaned up, and we we uh, we did a good job. I think everybody was great. So thanks to everybody that helped with that. Northern Nevada, we were just up there. It's, it's funny because we were saying, Janine and I were just talking last week about how we didn't need to say anything about Northern Nevada because it was before the last meeting. It was actually after the last meeting. It's amazing how time flies. But since the last meeting, we've been up to Northern Nevada, and this is one of our new custodians taking her tortoise that already had a name, Frank. By the time we, by the time we got there, it was already named. I, I guess on the, uh, on the bright side, it's, it's a lot easier with an adult. We, we always hear of these people that adopt a tortoise that's young, give it a name, and then it turns out that they gave it the name Frank, and it turns out to be a girl. So at least in this situation, we were good. It was, it was Frank, and uh, they were absolutely delighted with their new tortoise and coming out to meetings with us. So Janina did eight adoptions in the Reno and Gardnerville area last time. And we're going to be... As soon as Nancy just arrived, I can thank her again for, uh, for helping out with, with the location for the mega diet bagging. I don't think we could have put in any more people. <laughs> no. no, it was... It was, it was time, I'm sure. And, and as Kathy was saying, everybody that said that they were going to show up pretty much did, which was also nice to see. Uh, we did another meeting in Pahrump. We went up there, the, uh, the media coverage was great. Every television station, every radio station, and every newspaper did something on the workshop. So either it was really slow news or they were really happy that we were there. And um, unfortunately, on the day that we arrived, both of the, the windows to the uh, University of Nevada Cooperative Extension were broken when we got there. So that was, that was unfortunate timing, but couldn't have had a better welcome and lots of interest up there. So we've now added Pahrump into our uh, round of places that we go to to do our workshops. And there were over 30 people at the, at the event. The next big thing coming up, and it, it may look like it's a few days away, but it actually starts this Tuesday. We're going to be doing or working with Fish and Wildlife, helping out with the sterilization clinic of pet tortoises, and that's just the most amazing room you could ever imagine. I just stood there with my mouth open for about two or three minutes looking at the amazing equipment that they have in this place. Uh, the work starts for us on Tuesday because if, you, if you're doing operations on the 27th and the 28th, we have to go back a week to um, get everything prepared. So this Tuesday, 
We're going to be working on microchipping the tortoises that are going to be involved in the clinic, and, and we're also going to be weighing them all. We've got to do all the measurements to make sure that, that the ones that go into the clinic are the ones that we're operating on. So we're going to be doing a lot of work this week. Next week, we have to soak them all. We have to get them all ready, prep them, take them all into the Equendo Center on the 26th. And then the, the big days, the 27th and the 28th. 27th is mostly theory. We have a couple of vets coming in, one from Georgia and one from Arizona, who are experts in these new techniques for sterilizing tortoises. And we have vets coming in to learn from Arizona, Texas, Utah, Nevada, and California, all to learn how to sterilize tortoises so that they can provide a service to us and provide a service to everybody because one of the biggest problems that we still have and that we're still trying to pound that message is separate breeding pairs, don't have tortoise breeding. Uh, it's, it's still the main issue that we face today. And, and when you think Desert Tortoise Conservation Center is closing and there's really nowhere to take tortoises anymore, so it's, it's a big issue and it continues to be an issue. And we're hoping that this sterilization clinic is, is one of the tools that we can use to, to address that. Yeah. So all of those tortoises will be sterilized, are they, I mean, the ideal is that they're all be active tell adoptions, is that right? Or yeah. Be relocated, because that would be, I mean, Yeah, not, none of the ones that are being sterilized are going into the wild. And and with this, with this first clinic, it's not pet tortoises. We've had a few people call us and send emails saying, can I bring my tortoise to be sterilized? Well, because it's the first one, it's really uh, just a, a learning opportunity and, and nobody really wanted the responsibility of doing a lot of operations that involve pet tortoises. So the first one is just learning and then we'll, we'll take it from there. And Fish and Wildlife Services is running this. We're just helping out with all of the volunteers. And if anybody is here that hasn't already volunteered and would like to, we have about nine different things, different tasks that we're working on starting Tuesday with the with the microchipping. I printed out my sheet and it printed out so small that I think I can maybe just about read it. But, but uh, if anybody is interested in adding their name to that list, please feel free to find me at the break or at the end of the of the workshop or the meeting today and we can add you into that list to, to help out. We, we started with 47 slots, and I think I have one, two, three, four, seven, maybe 11 slots left. Wow. And, and what's, um, what surprised me totally was I thought everybody's going to want to go to the Equendo Center and be in there when the operations are taking place. That's the one that I still need the most, uh, most volunteers for. So if anybody's interested in that, and it doesn't mean that you have to um, get involved and do the operation yourself or mop up blood or anything like that. It's just just helping out, really being a, a gopher if somebody says, we need, a, we need another tortoise here or we need a towel or I need this. So it's really just helping out with the, with the vets. And with, there's going to be eight stations where operations are going to be taking place. So there'll be a volunteer at each station just to help out and just to be there in case something crazy happens or in case the, the vet that's doing the operation needs some help, needs something fetching. The Equendo Center is at the corner of, believe it or not, Equendo and Eastern. So it's just in behind the airport. On 215? No, Eastern. Oh, right here. Like across from the Walmart? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah just, just, just near the Walmart. I, we, Janina and I, um, we navigate by Del Taco restaurants. It's right across from a Del Taco. So uh, it's, it's, on, it's, on, it's on Eastern anyway, behind the airport. It, it was great going up to Northern Nevada and finding a Del Taco on the en route. It was a great quick get in, get some food, get out. So, um, and, and I'm sure that the Del Taco probably does a great deal of business for people at the Equendo Center. It's, it's, a, great, it's a great facility. And um, anybody that has volunteered, we'll be sending out information a day or so before your particular shift so that you know where to go and, and what you're, you're helping out with. Is there a, is there a building number? On the Quendo? Yeah, there is. I, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but, but it's, it, it is on Eastern, and it's one of those as you're driving south, it's on your, on your left, and you can't. It, between Russell and Sunset. Okay. It's a four-way stop here.
Yeah. For, yeah. So beautiful facility. Anybody who wants the opportunity to go in there and, and be a part of the first ever sterilization clinic, we still uh, we still would love to have your help. And spell Del Taco. Pardon? <laughs> oh, uh, D E L T A C O. <laughs> well, you'll, 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 capital T, you'll, capital T, capital T, capital T. <laughs> and, and you'll be able to find it because either Janine or I's vehicle will be outside there for the for the duration of the clinics. <laughs> so what's coming up? Well, we have more adoptions coming up right after the sterilization clinic. We're going to be going up to Reno again. We think we're going to be doing some presentations and some uh, workshops on brumation in Reno, Carson City, Fallon, Pahrump, and, uh, and we wonder why we never have a Saturday off, I don't know. It's one of those crazy things that just keeps us going. The next meeting here is Saturday, September the 20th, and there'll be a documentary launched. Uh, it's been created by Alan Selden of Southern Methodist University, and there'll also be a presentation on wild desert tortoise threats, so it's going to be a, a nice, interesting meeting for us for the next one in September. Some uh, other little developments that we've had. I know that as we're a nonprofit, we're always raising money and we do have our little donation box at the front. One way that we've discovered recently where people can help out without actually spending a dime on Tortoise Group is by going to Amazon Smile, which is smile.amazon.com. So if anybody here spends money on Amazon, which I do and which everybody, okay, we got lots of people that spend money on Amazon. If you go to smile.amazon.com, you can register to donate to a charity on there. And they give 0.05% of everything that you spend to the charity of your choice. So I've, I think I've already converted five or six people. The person that I spoke to at Amazon was so taken by what we do that he said he was switching over, and I see his name on that now as well. So we've got about seven or eight people, and I wish I'd known about this before I bought my new hiking shoes, because that would have been a little bit more. But if anybody wants to go to, uh, to smile.amazon.com and just sign up, you just type in, it'll ask you what charity you want to support. You can type in Tortoise Group, and there you go. You don't have to do anything. You can help out Tortoise Group in that way. And I'm sure that we'll find lots more of these as time goes by, but this is just the first one that we've, uh, we've come across. And as I said, a lot of people use Amazon to, uh, to buy things for going back to school, Christmas, birthdays. So another opportunity to help out TG. And I guess now it's over to Kathy for the, uh, the August tips, and I'll just run over and try and bring up the presentation. <laughs> Oh, you can do that. Well, while you're doing that, in case you didn't know, that's, that's Jim Cornell, our executive director. And I'm Kathy Utiger, chairman of the board. And, <clears throat> hi. <laughs> and I've been, okay, thanks. Better? Well, um, we have a person who's been working very long, as oh, lots of people have been working very long with Tortoise Group. But um, about two years ago, our treasurer, Trilla, said she really couldn't continue being treasurer. It was just too much. Uh, it's a big job. You see her sitting back there every meeting selling tortoise food. You probably think that's about all she does. But there's a lot of activity with Tortoise Group and and of course, hopefully, lots more coming in. And um, we asked for a volunteer to take over, and we were unable to find anyone to take over for the last two years. So poor Trell has been hanging on now for 13 years, is it? 13 years. And she has done the most fantastic job. She's always there, always cranking out checks and making sure everything works. And, and um, well, we did have a little time when she used our credit card to buy some tires. <laughs> and then it turned out somebody snagged our, uh, our credit cards and they, they charged us for going um, skydiving. That was last summer. But, but she caught those things right away. And uh, she's retiring now. And in fact, just this week, we turned over our, 
our signature authority to a new treasurer and we hired a bookkeeper. And so today I want to just give Trilla a little something, which is this really nifty cup and it says on it, the tortoise is the symbol for peace and protection. And I just, I want to ask Trilla to come up here, please. You, you can't imagine how difficult this has been for her all this time, so, along with her own business and everything else, and for her to just continue to do this all these years, I just want to say a very special thank you. like we always do. That's the change from last month. So it's cooler, and even it, it's been just amazingly cool, hasn't it? At this time, last year, last month, it was average was 97 degrees. Actually, it was 91 yesterday, the average. But a week ago, the average temperature was 87. So that's a 10 degree difference in just a month. So the plants are kind of rejuvenating and the, the burrow and the tortoise, the amount of time they can be out, that's all changing. <clears throat> My tortoise is uh, stomping around even more than ever. Anybody else is getting active? The testosterone level goes up in the fall and they, they're out there just pacing around. That's normal, normal behavior. So they're, they're gonna be very active now, unless we, I shouldn't say this, maybe it'll get hot again, but maybe not. And if not, <clears throat> then they're just gonna have a couple of good months, September into October, maybe even into November. Again, the changes are in diet, so this is just what we were saying. They, they, uh, after the summer, when theoretically they weren't eating so much, but ours didn't slow down this summer. Did, what did you find? Did your, did your tortoise say it was too darn hot? Yours did, and they, they didn't eat. Really, and they didn't come out for a week at a time, just like we said, they read the book, everything. <laughs> ours was out every day eating, so he didn't know. The, the change that's happened in, in our yard is that it's become very shady. It used to be, when I moved in, there was nothing there. Now it's become very shady, so his behavior has changed because of that. It's cooler. Now, they may not be eating those, those um, flowers because they're, they're going to change toward fall things, and that's dry stuff. So if your grass dies, have, do you have any dry stuff, Diane? I have an entire front yard that the landscapers take care of, and I took her out there, and she met all the neighbors a couple of days ago. <laughs> it's right in front of the mailboxes, and all the neighbors stopped and said hello to her. How wonderful. But yeah, she really is into the grasses right now. But That's this cool. is wet grass, regular grass, green yeah. grass in your yard. But in fall, or even maybe not even yet, but starting in September, they're going to be more interested in dried grasses and the leaves. So don't rake up all the leaves. This is great. Leave the spurge, leave the dried leaves, leave, leave all of that for them to browse on. 
and see what happens. They'll, they'll pick out different ones, so it may be a little tricky to find out just which ones they're going to eat. But they'll snoop around and they won't eat the ones they don't like, and they will eat the ones they do like. Now we were at the nursery and we said, well, I thought I'd scope out to tell you what was there, and they had gazanias, and they had portulaca, and I've heard that tortoises like portulaca. So we bought portulaca, and it was so bright and colorful, and all these flowers, and we put it down, and Tad sniffed and sniffed, and he took one bite. <laughs> Didn't like it. Now, I've... Some people say, oh yeah, they like it, but not ours. And um, a week ago, we went shopping at Plant World, and they did have more of a selection than the Star Nurseries. But well, come September, you know, there'll be some good things out there. I find Plant World better for all the, for all the plants you need. Right. They usually have more of a second So when you get ready this fall to put in some stuff, hopefully you'll get the urge to go out and get some new plants. And I brought some seeds, and, and at the break, um, feel free to take some. Now, these are Alita's hollyhocks from last time that are still here in enormous bunches. And then there are some dandelion seeds and some of uh, some of our Cactus Joe's mix. And we brought these from our yard. And we said, well, if you just picked up one of these, just like this, instead of needing a fistful, it's got, you know, like 30 seeds in it. It's just one little blossom. What are those? Hollyhocks. Oh. But Alita's got 600 in a bag or something like that. So you're so you're welcome to have hollyhock seeds. Well, and that's a hollyhock. They grow tall, and and these flowers grow up like this, and we just plunk them off and put them on the ground. Yes. No. They're like a wildflower. They'll come up at different times. I planted some and then three years from now they come up. You didn't want to wait three I years, let me guess. And, and they don't like special care. They eat like crappy ground and, and now that it rains, I've got some coming up. Red sun or what they'll do today. Yes, now what what Alina said was they don't like special care. And we, we noticed that before. We had a comparison of some that had mulch over them and were beautiful and some that were just fell on the ground. And it was just those that just fell on the ground that did the best. So this is a good time of year. You'll be able to keep things a little bit moist. And uh, so it's a good time to be starting any of these seeds now. And anything else you can get and put in now, it'll be terrific. Also, oh, guess who? There's my boy. Notice I've tr kind of kept the, this is his grape house. So it comes out here so he can eat it and play with it. And here's some globe mallow. But I've trimmed it so that he can walk along here. Now you're going to have a lot of growth now. It's that time when the fall growth is coming. So remember to look occasionally so you can keep all that. I'm always worried about it poking him in the eye. You know, I, I know it won't bother his shell and everything, but he just goes along with his eyes open. You know, I never see them close their eyes, so that worries me. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about worry, worry, worry. Because so much people tell me, oh, I'm so worried about this, I'm so worried about that, and so on. So I wanted to just go through a couple of things that you don't need to worry about. Now, do you ever hear a little whistling noise and you think, oh my, uh-oh, upper respiratory disease? A tortoise has very narrow nasal passages and our tortoise whistles all the time. 
It's just the way it is. And they could get a little something in there, you know, a little piece of dirt or something, and that would cause a whistling. So then in itself is it an indication of a sick tortoise. Now, when they're eating, especially with this new mega diet, it's supposed to be served very juicy. Well, this whole cavity is one, the nose and the mouth is one big cavity. And, and they just take this, you know, big slurps in, one right after the other. And when they're breathing, some of that fluid can come back out the nose and you could see a bubble. So that's just food. So again, I think it's because we're so unfamiliar with tortoises that it's so scary. But that's just, just food, and if there's going to be any bubbling, it would be at some other time when they're not eating. The, that pacing that a tortoise does is normal. And I was telling somebody that Tad is just scraping the shell. It's just terrible. We've got a block wall, of course, and it's got a thing that projects at the bottom. And instead of turning out away from the wall, he always turns into the wall. And his shell goes And he's scraping the whole edge of it. And it's getting all, all chunked up. <laughs> and I'm, I don't like it, but I don't know what we're going to do. Maybe put some rubber bumpers out there. <laughs> but it's what they do. So if, they're, so if I'm not going to worry about it anymore, I have to think of a solution for that. Now, a, a lady who has a new tortoise, big, big adult tortoise, told me she was very worried that the tortoise kept knocking on the slider and wanting to come in. And she didn't want it to come in, and she's um, uh, handicapped in her movements, and so she can't go crawling under the bed to get it out. But, but she didn't know what to do. You know, what do you do? Do you let it in? Do you not let it in? And, and well, what we do is we let them in, we let them roam around for a little while, and then we put them out. And that depends upon how comfortable you are with what your tortoise wants. This tortoise that she's gotten obviously had come into the house wherever it lived before, and she's not so comfortable with it. So she's dealing with closing the doors now so that it can come in a little bit and then go out. But there's nothing wrong with letting your tortoise in, if you feel like it, and if you feel it's not going to damage anything. You have to watch for the going around the edge, because that's where all the power cords are. You hear things going, again, you know, vases, lamps. <laughs> Got to watch out. Couple more things. Um, Again, if you're, if you're kind of new to tortoises, you might not know about whether how much you should touch a tortoise or not, and we just sort of maul ours. You know, I go up to him and I hug him, pet him on his shell, and when I greet him, I usually reach down and pet him under his chin, and, and he puts his head up, and we pet him on the top of the head, and I used to hold him here, but he's getting kind of big now, but you could. Some people bring them in to watch TV, all kinds of things. Just, just depends. I knew the lady whose tortoise slept on their bed, and they had a ramp up onto the bed. And no kidding. <laughs> yes. Well, you, and if they've never been, if they haven't been picked up much, they're really unhappy with it, and their legs are going like crazy. And the more used to it they become, the more they sort of just hang out, and, and they're okay with it. So, and the salmonella—that's another thing that comes up pretty regularly. And. Uh, we talked about this and we've had a couple articles about it, but I just wanted to review it again. It's really, really, really tough to get salmonella from a desert tortoise. What Dr. Kolmstetter told us was that 
Desert tortoises carry about 2,000 kinds of salmonella somewhere in them. And when they poop, they might have some salmonella in there, and they might not. So if you were going to go and test your tortoise for salmonella, it, it, wouldn't it might be positive, it might be negative, it would just depend upon what was happening right then. So in order for you to get salmonella from your tortoise, you have, your tortoise has to have pooped some salmonella, and you have to pick that up and get it into your mouth. I think they're saying that's not real possible. So you can see that children could handle the scats, and then they could put their hands in their mouths. It's possible. Now the salmonella worry really is from the turtles. Water turtles are pooping in the water, and then you're cleaning the tank, and you're handling the turtles, and there's salmonella all over the place. But with the desert tortoise, that is a whole different situation. So if someone keeps telling you that's a concern, well, what we heard, Dr. Kolmstetter told us she'd never heard of a case of salmonella, which was very reassuring. But when might you worry? So there are some times to, to worry when your tortoise isn't eating. Now there are times when they don't feel like eating, when it's really hot, but if your tortoise isn't eating, and you know how much they should be eating unless you're brand new to it, don't let that go on for too long. Or if you haven't seen your tortoise for a couple of weeks and you, and you should be seeing it, then again, you need to take some action. If a tortoise has a really goopy nose, you might see a bubble. It could be from stress, from heat, from cold or something. You might want to just keep an eye on that for a week or two, but if they get a snotty nose and oh, there's a lot of mucus gooping down there, just like with your kid, you would take them to the vet or the doctor. That's cheaper. <laughs> take your kid to the vet, it'd probably be more fun. Yeah, right. Actually, we just took Tad for his yearly physical and or checkup. He was healthy and strong and handsome and good looking, and, you know. And he had an x-ray, and he is starting another bladder stone, but it hasn't grown, it's still tiny. $65 was what it cost us. So I didn't think that was bad. And it was reassuring for us that things were going okay. Now, in the fall, but much later on, if a tortoise fails to go into brumation, it might be sick. I had a man emailing me last, last winter and saying, my tortoise won't go in, I, I'm so worried. Well, it was early November, and then it was Thanksgiving, and then it got later, and I said, you really should take it to the vet. Well, it died. Aww. He didn't take it to the vet, and it, it, he didn't know what was wrong, he didn't see anything, but the tortoise wouldn't go into brumation, and because it, I guess it knew whatever it did, but it didn't make it. That didn't mean the vet could have saved it, but they probably could have assessed what was wrong. So we had a funny year again last year. It took a long time for all the tortoises to go down, but keep an eye on that. Another thing that happened, um, Janina emailed me about this. Somebody had uh, smelled really strong smelling urine, and they said, well, is this bad? Well, the answer is it's bad if it's different, if this is something new for your tortoise. So again, if anything happens that it's lethargic or it's not eating or there's this funny change in color or something, that's something to keep an eye on. And if it doesn't get better, whisk it off to the vet because you sure don't want anything to go wrong. And if you're, if you're thinking about going to the vet, you want to do it in good time before brumation. So really the tortoise is going to start having cha hormonal changes in September. And they're going to start slowing down whether you see it or not. So you want to get in by around now so that if they need a course of 
antibiotics or something, they'll still be um, at their strongest and, and um, their body will be going at the top rate rather than medium rate. And I'm going to talk about this again. Well, I've put this on more darn times in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> the time it rained 1.1 inches, it was on, which is amazing. And then the time it, the, all the other times when it didn't rain or it rained three drops, it was there too, and I finally gave up. But anyway, I'm home and I can do that most of the time. It helps, helps the dirt to deal with the water if you happen to be home, but be sure to remove it so that you don't trap any heat in there afterwards. And there's my boy. I come around the corner and he says, oh, there you are, and he sticks his head up and he comes running. And just remember in the fall to enjoy your tortoise, plant the seeds, watch for the changes, and um, this is a fabulous season coming up. Any thoughts or questions? Okay, well let's um, take a break now for about 15 minutes. And after that, we have Jim Moore right here and his so new associate as well. And we'll be talking about, he'll be talking to us about solar power and all the things going on in Nevada. And I wanna thank Earl and Dominique for bringing the wonderful refreshments we have today. Talk to you soon. Before we do, before we bring Jim on to talk, I, I really should, I've been waffling about this, so let me just go ahead and say what we're doing. We're getting started with a couple of um, funds that we're, we're going to work on, but I want to just introduce it today part of it, and that is we're going to create a fund to take care of emergency issues and also people who are in need in different ways. And um, for instance, we support the women's prison, the habitat at the women's prison. And this year we've taken two sets of plants, 10 bags of mega diet, and um, now we're going to add another tortoise, so we're going to build another burrow. So there's that expense and the water dish. And we'd like to be able to take one of the tortoises to the vet. And um, we have ongoing expenses there. And so we would like your support in taking care of, of this that has no other support. And also we have people who come to us who would like to have a tortoise, but they don't have the funds to, for instance, build the burrow, which takes some outlay, you know, and get the plants in and all that. And so we'd like to help in more ways than just muscle. We can get some volunteers, but we don't have a way to get, to order the, the uh, soil from Vista and to buy the wood and, and all that. So we're asking you to put some money in our donation box here, if you would, and we can put it toward, we're gonna to call it the Shell Fund, and it's going to have some various aspects to it. Um, and this is, this is the beginning of, of our Shell Fund, and that's... This is the box. That's the box. Thank you, Cheryl. Anybody who wishes who can walk right up here and put some money in here and that will go toward the burrow that Janina's boyfriend, Janina's boyfriend is going to build it built for us and he's going to deliver it to the prison for us. So he's doing a lot of volunteer work, but we still need to buy the supplies. It'll end up being about $80, I guess. And it's on Facebook. And um, we're getting going with this. So we're going to ask if you could just donate a couple of dollars. We'd appreciate it very much. And now for the main feature, I'd like to introduce Jim Moore. He's a long time member of Taurus Group. He's a life member of Taurus Group. <laughs> 
he was on our board, and then he had to go and move to Phoenix. So, so he's leaving us in just a little bit, but he's taking time out now to tell us more about the solar energy development and so on in Nevada. So please help me welcome Jim. Thanks, everybody. Uh, it's a good turnout. Um, I, this is a, a repeat, um, I'm sorry to say, from last year's talk, but there is some new information. And I asked Kathy if this would be of interest, and I see some new faces, so I think there's uh, uh, some additional um, knowledge transfer that can happen here and maybe get some people excited about um, maybe changing the direction that, that uh, Southern Nevada is going in terms of how we uh, meet our renewable energy standards and how we treat the desert in our backyards. And this is all, of course, related to your primary interest of desert tortoises because this is their natural habitat. So even though they're doing well in your backyards, as you saw from, may have seen in the latest uh, review journal editorial where uh, he's questioning the, the sanity of sterilization and translocation and stopping, you know, limiting backyard breeding, um, it really is the wild population that, that needs the attention in terms of the persistence of this species well into the future, far beyond when, when our individual pets um, past the great burrow beyond. Um, so what I wanted to do was uh, kind of give a run through of kind of what are the different types of renewable energy that are being built now in the, in the desert. I get a lot of questions when people find out that I work for the Nature Conservancy or that I'm working in the desert. They always ask me, what is that big thing right at the state line when you're driving to Southern California? And I know there's a lot of inf interest in that. Um, it, it's you can't miss it, you can't ignore it, and so I wanted to explain a little bit about that technology in particular and, and some other projects that are coming up in the future. If I may ask, there's two sites there. There's one on the Nevada side and the other on the California side. You're talking about both of them? Yes, yeah, well, and, and <laughs> those to come in the same area, so we'll cover that. Um, so why is the Nature Conservancy interested in Mojave Desert, and why is this um, turning into the kind of the solar capital of, of the United States. And this is why. It's got the highest degree of insulation, that's the highest degree of uh, sun exposure in the U.S. It's the least developed of all the continental ecoregions. Those are those uh, regions of the U.S., there's 81 of them in the continental U.S., that are defined by specific plant community types or enigmatic, enigmatic species like the desert tortoise. And in the Mojave, it's defined by the uh, Joshua tree and Cree silk uh, as well as the desert tortoise. So um, additionally, there's the most publicly owned lands of any ecoregion in the United States. So there's lots of opportunity for industry to come here and say, okay, government, you know, you're encouraging, me, encouraging us to meet a renewable energy standard. Uh, give me the land to do it. Let me do it for you know, pennies on the dollar compared to what it would cost to build these things on private land. And um, also for the energy companies, this type of industrial scale, these huge facilities allow them to control the output of, of the power output. So you'll hear me talk later on about why there's this constant pushback or tension between um, rooftop solar installations and these large scale um, facilities being built in the desert. So um, first, let's cover something about public lands management. There's 86% uh, roughly of, of Southern Nevada is, um, of the Mojave, excuse me, is publicly owned, largely uh, BLM, Bureau of Land Management, but also National Park Service, Department of Defense, uh, Forest Service, Depart um, Department of Energy, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, these are these vast open spaces that are being designated for many different uh, uses. You'll often hear here that uh, People talk about multiple use, and that's really the, the guiding principle of the Bureau of Land Management, is to provide opportunities for multiple use. That includes designating areas as wilderness, um, recognizing historic, archaeological, and, and Native American cultural sites, and protecting them from any future uh, development or vandalism. 
uh, sand and gravel operations, which uh, provide the materials for road building, uh, you know, home home building uh, development within the, uh, these urban valleys. Um, something close to my heart: <laughs> uh, off-road vehicle racing. Um, I'm saying that um, sarcastically. Um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, providing the uh, the space and the opportunity for. Uh, people to get out and, and tear things up. That's and that's that's what they I mean that's kind of their marching orders. And then um, afterwards trying to fix the damage. Um, spending lots of money trying to rehabilitate, restore Mojave Desert, which is largely at this point a losing enterprise. Extremely expensive, very low success rate. Um, and of course the creature why we're all here, um, the desert tortoise. So they have to pay attention to listed species, federally listed species, state listed species, those that are on the precipice of being listed. So that those that they recognize are uh, not listed but are declining and for which some groups have said, you know, you better pay attention to this thing. They're, they're starting to, their numbers are starting to go down. So the Bureau of Land Management has to pay attention to these and it's in their um, guiding principle or their uh, legislative order that they are not supposed to do things that cause the listing of additional species. So it's important to recognize that not only do they have to accommodate listed species, they are not supposed to do things that drive the, uh, the decline of additional species that may be listed. And then, of course, the new, new wrinkle in, in their land management um, uh, portfolio is renewable energy. It, it's, it's caught everybody by surprise. At about 2008 to 2010, they were swamped by applications from uh, renewable energy uh, companies, mul uh, many of them from overseas, Germany, Australia, Israel, um, that recognized that the government, the new government, was going to have a, a renewable energy portfolio that was higher than ever, ever um, previously uh, determined or um, um, mandated. And so they saw this as kind of the new gold rush. And they rushed in literally, and there were applications stacked on top of each other, five deep, so that if the first ones fell through because they didn't, weren't economically viable or didn't show the, you know, the, opportunity, the expertise necessary to move forward with the project, then the second one would, would uh, take the next precedent. So it was an incredible rush, and BLM was caught really with their hands in the air going, how do we do this? How do we process these? We were caught un un unaware because we had no idea this was coming. And so previous to th this, uh, this uh, new uh, use of the desert, our main concern were off-road vehicles and livestock grazing. Livestock grazing, as many of you know, has almost disappeared in the desert, with one exception in, in the northeast of the county that we're all familiar with. It shall remain unnamed. Um, but this one took, took them by surprise, not only by the uh, enormous scope of these, and the, that is how many of them were being planned, but by their scale, the size of them. We're, we're talking about 5,000, 6,000, some 10,000 acre um, applications coming in for these facilities. This is nothing they've ever dealt with before, short of uh, you know, Las Vegas Valley being plopped in the middle of a, another uh, valley in the desert. So uh, to deal with this in 2010, and uh, again, we were behind the curve. The Nature Conservancy found some uh, donors in California to invest in our ability to assess the entire Mojave Desert, all four states, Nevada, California, Utah, and Arizona, and look at how can we try to direct this uh, high-speed train coming at all of us and try to make more sense of how these things are built, where they're built, and how they're operated, given the, the realities of the Mojave Desert, that is, the limitations or the, the sensitivities of spaces, but also the limitation of groundwater. So we broke up the Mojave Desert into six uh, six regions that were defined by uh, desert tortoise genetics as well as um, Joshua tree uh, differences and some other floristic um, differences. And that's only important just because we set goals to protect uh, certain areas 
um, or, or a certain percentage of land and species occurrences within each of these six so that we would capture the full range of genetic variation of those species throughout the Mojave. So that you're not just saying, okay, let's protect 10% of desert tortoise habitat. Well, you could do that all here. But it's important to know that desert tortoises are evolving. All the species are evolving in response to different climatic regimes, different uh, environmental pressures, all along the boundaries of the, the ecoregion. So it's important to protect examples of all those species in each of these six subregions. That's why we do this. Um, and we won't get too much into the weeds, but we do this by setting targets for the goals, uh, characterizing all the land uses, identify re relative uh, conservation value of all uh, these um, uh, acres in the uh, 53,000, um, actually 53,000 square mile um, Mojave Desert in all those, uh, in the four states. And then we uh, characterize each of those square miles in, into one of four categories. Ecological core, that is those areas that are absolutely necessary to capture what is what it is that defines the Mojave Desert different than the Sonoran, the Great Basin, or some of the other ecoregions surrounding us. Um, and then ecologically intact, those areas that may not be essential for the species, um, uh, to meet the species goals, but are important to act as buffers around those core areas. And then degraded and highly converted. So this gives you an idea of kind of the scale at which we are operating. We had 53,000 of these hexagons that encompass one square mile. And this is uh, down by Laughlin. So it shows you how we uh, determined the degree of degradation or intactness of these um, uh, square mile hexagons. So the ecologically intact would be there's no evidence of development at all. Highly converted is where 25% or more of the uh, hexagon is uh, developed irretrievably. Um, moderately degraded is where it may be, there may be some uh, development, but it's development that can accommodate wildlife use. So a golf course, um, you know, obviously water birds use them. Um, many other uh, species can still use golf courses, even though they're not obviously na natural in their occurrence. And then ecologically intact, ecologically core would be those areas that, for instance, if there was a rare fish right here in this bay, then it only occurred there, that would be designated as ecologically core. So that's how the, this is how the entire um, ecoregion breaks down into its into these designations. And what's important to note is um, really what the the degree of intactness of this ecoregion. Even though when when at first blush we may think, well, the Mojave Desert's really been kind of used and abused over the years. It has, but in very specific locations, not over its entirety. And that's really why it was important for us to be able to speak intelligently about the degree of degradation um, that occurs, that's existing now in the Mojave Desert, and how that can be used for future planning of industrial uses like solar energy. So you see the obvious areas like Las Vegas, Pahrump, uh, um, with Laughlin, uh, Riverside, Barstow, um, but then there's these other, these big areas here that are moderately called, considered moderately degraded, and these are the Department of Defense, largely uh, Fort Irwin. Um, this is Sandy Valley, or Sandy Valley here, Sandy Valley here. Um, so these are the areas that are, you know, they're impacted, but they're not completely converted. Um, Amargosa Valley. Um, so it's important to know these are the areas that we would like, the orange areas really, where we'd like to uh, direct some of these new developments because the, the already converted uh, habitat is, is probably permanently converted into something, you know, what we call hard infrastructure. It couldn't be uh, switched to something like solar energy other than rooftop solar. Um, so it's really the orange areas that we're going to be concentrating on. I should point this at the machine and not, not the screen. <laughs> okay, so the results were um, high conservation value, 86% of the Mojave occurs within these two categories. Uh, low conservation value, 14% of the Mojave occurs in either moderately degraded or highly converted. Um, by landowner, that breaks down to BLM owns 45% of these really important, the dark green and the green areas. Um, 
beyond, I'm sorry, 49% of the dark green and light green areas. Park Service, no surprise there. Department of Defense, that's, that's kind of surprising, but they have huge landscapes that are the most protected that you can ever get. I mean, if you wanted to set aside a, or establish some uh, precedent for a national wildlife refuge, it would be something like Nellis Air Force Base. Or most of the activity is aerial, very little of it is done on the ground, and so that's why it's, it's one of our most important protected areas. Uh, for the converted lands, um, again, no surprise, private 85% and 57% um, of all of converted, um, degraded and converted. So our, our conclusion is um, it's rich in conservation value, highly unique in many of the species that, that are found in it and has still large blocks of undisturbed land that we would like to maintain as undisturbed land for future, um, f to, make, to be able to entertain future options, either for new types of development, new types of recreation, new conservation priorities. Um, if you build on it now and convert it, it's gonna be irretrievably changed for you know, 200 years plus. So we want to protect these large blocks. 14%, 4.5 million acres is, uh, moderately degraded or highly converted and includes many sites that are very, um, uh, would be low risk for a solar energy uh, company to come into and be able to develop or propose development with very few ecological constraints. So let's talk about renewable energy technologies then. There's, there's a, many of them that have kind of come and gone uh, with, with uh, the changes in economics. One thing you'll notice um, right off the bat, uh, these are not green projects. This is what the desert looks like underneath them. This is the old um, solar tower in Daggett, uh, California, which has since been decommissioned, but uh, there's no restoration at this site. It looks very much like this right now. It's just the lights turned off. Um, so once you do this to the desert, uh, for as long as we're alive and our kids are alive and our kids' kids are alive, it's going to remain like that or it'll become a weed patch. That's about it. Um, so this is, this is called the solar um, tower technology, solar power technology. Um, and it basically involves a central tower on which many uh, mirrors surrounding it are focusing the sunlight. And these, each mirror is controlled by a computer which tracks the sun and changes the, the angle uh, of incidence with the sun so that it focuses it directly on the, power, on the central tower. Uh, most technology involves uh, sending water up into the tower, heating it, superheating it to steam. The steam goes down, turns a turbine, the turbine generates electricity, and that's shipped off mostly now to Southern California. Very little of any of this energy is coming into Nevada. Uh, this is uh, one technology that you'll see south of Boulder City in the El Dorado Valley. Uh, this is called uh, concentrated solar or um, power trough, um, uh, parabolic trough technology. And basically what that is, is long rows of mirrors that are shaped like that and a central pipe going through the center of it carrying water. In other countries, they use something like, they use different types of oil. Here, they use water, and so it's extremely water consumptive. Um, and in the desert, it's, it's very inappropriate. Um, but uh, these arrays take up a lot of space, use a lot of water, and require a lot of maintenance because those parabolic mirrors need to be cleaned often uh, in order for them to maintain their um, concentrating uh, heat capacity. This uh, technology you may recognize from uh, at UNLV. Uh, they used to have two of these, and both of them are now, one of them is gone, and the other one is in permanent state of um, uh, off. It's just decommissioned. Um, it's very, uh, it's very uh, technically high maintenance, lots of moving parts. It's called the Sterling Engine um, Dish. And basically what it does is the same thing this does, but on a smaller scale. So it uses a bunch of little mirrors that focus on a central uh, terminal here that then runs um, uh, water. I believe it, it, it uses the same uh, water technology. I'm not sure of that. Um, uh, the Sterling engine is different than, than other technologies, but this is very labor intensive. It's very noisy, lots of moving parts and so high, high to maintain, and, and especially in the desert environment. So you don't see these out in, on, at scale anywhere, really. 
And then the, the another thing you'll see at UNLV are these large, um, and also at uh, the uh, Henderson at the old uh, BMI complex. Um, they're using these from Amonix, a company that just went out of uh, business last year, um, which is large-scale uh, photovoltaic panels, each mounted on its own individual um, tilting panel that tracks the sun. And then, of course, uh, wind technology. And I'm not going to cover wind today. That's got its own, its own issues. But uh, uh, these are the main, kind of the big four, big three of... Uh, uh, solar energy. And this is Ivanpah Valley. This is what you're seeing when you drive south uh, at the state line. Just to give you a, a scale, uh, an imagination of how big this, this thing is, and also the impact that it's having on this valley, the Ivanpah Valley. Uh, this was once very high dense, density tortoise habitat, extremely low impact. There was one, um, if you drive by, you'll see there's one, that one prim golf course about here, and then one small little cattle corral somewhere out here. And that's it. This, this is as close as you're going to get to old growth Mojave forest. Uh, if you walk out there, you see you know, large cacti, yuccas, a very healthy, diverse uh, ecosystem with very few impacts, except for now this. 3,500 acres has been now uh, not belated. Um, to their credit, they um, they wanted to have as, as little impact as possible on, on this uh, landscape. And so instead of blading it, they do a, a different thing that I'll show you soon. Um, and so, Jim, if you could uh, turn this on. I'll, I'll show you kind of what, what this, oops, it's not showing. Sorry, the, the linking didn't quite work when we tried it. It's supposed to have an embedded uh, link. Well, if, if the technology won't allow it, then well, <laughs> let me explain it to you if I can. This thing is called a brush hog, and you can go home and, and Google this or look it up on YouTube. It's called a brush hog. Just type in brush hog versus yucca. And basically, it's a huge lawnmower that r runs on a, a rolling track. Maybe that'll get it. There you go. Just to get, give you an idea of what it took to uh, to clear this. Um. Well, now I'll watch Lon listen to Lana Del Rey. <laughs> what? what, what <laughs> yeah, except it's got these grinding rotors on the front, and it just goes from creosote bush to yucca. To, uh, to large cactus, barrel cactus, and just mows it down to sawdust. It just goes one after the other. Oh, that's it. There we go. It's very loud, too. Yeah, you can do it when you get home. But it's just taking a while. I apologize for that. Um, we'll skip the, the other one too because that, that's even larger file. I think it's just the the speed of the internet here. We would need the audio for it anyway, Jim. So it's not going to work. We got it to run last. Last year, I'm not sure why, why, what the difference is. The, the hookup is different. Okay, let's go back to the slides. <coughs> so, were you saying that that was a better way to do it than um, it's, um, from a It's from an aspect of recovery after the project, so 20, 30 years, it probably is going to recover much quicker because it still has some component of the natural uh, community left on site. Um, it's not, you're not dealing with, you know, just bare ground that then it encourages weeds to grow. Uh, and then weeds bring fire and fire brings a complete change in the, in the Mojave Desert ecosystem. Um, so, um, 
It is better. Um, I'm really trying to encourage uh, UNLV or Desert Research Institute to do a comparative study of what kind of biodiversity persists in this uh, scenario of a, uh, basically a mode ecosystem versus a related ecosystem versus one right next door that's completely intact. I think it would be really interesting um, even to the solar company if they could, you know, herald that, uh, you know, this protected or this retains 75% of the, the biological diversity by doing this method versus uh, blading. I think that's something they would want to uh, use in their PR for any future projects. Go to slideshow. Yeah, that one. And slideshow from start from beginning slide. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So. What, what could pop, I mean, when, when I start talking about the downsides of renewable energy, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, it's kind of sobering to make sure that we're, this isn't, doesn't mean that I'm saying renewable energy is bad. Um, it certainly is a much better alternative than coal or nuclear energy. But it has its downsides, and we need to go into these uh, large-scale construction projects with our eyes open and not just assume, because the companies tell us it's green, that it's not always green. It can be done, there are ways in which it can be done better, and there's ways it can be done poorly. And uh, I want to kind of highlight both, both of those. So this is the, um, the Ivanpah solar tower uh, at full, kind of full steam. Usually uh, you'll see the steam coming out of the top here. Um, when the, uh, it's kind of venting the steam that's being created here. And this is your typical um, uh, solar uh, photovoltaic panel uh, uh, facility in, in uh, El Dorado Valley. So uh, one thing that's been noticed about um, these facilities, and if you're flying over it, over it you'll see it um, very clearly, is these things look like lakes. They look like bodies of water when you're flying over them because they're reflecting the sky. Um, and because of that, uh, migratory waterfowl, that as they're passing through these valleys on their way to and from places like Lake Mead or, Lake, or Powell or, or further south, um, they stop at these to refuel, uh, kind of refresh. And what they're finding is, um, uh, you know, these things look at both the, the uh, mirror technology as well as this is the uh, just photovoltaic panels. These are not supposed to be that reflective. And you can see the effect that they have on anything flying over. And so what they're finding are waterfowl dead in and amongst these panels. This is a pelican. Pelicans don't occur in the Mojave Desert, <laughs> in typical dry Mojave Desert. So what this probably represents is either a flying into the panel and you know, breaking its neck, or flying and landing in and amongst the panels and unable to take off again because it didn't get a drink of water, it didn't get a bite to eat um, in this rest stop. It, all it found was mirrors and, and hard ground underneath it. So um, they're finding lots of birds like this, not only waterfowl, but just migratory birds that are hitting the mirrors um, as they're flying through swifts and swallows. Um, one thing that was of particular concern at this Ivanpah facility was the Yuma Clapper Rail, which is another aquatic marsh bird um, here, but it's listed, it's federally listed as endangered. They don't have a permit to do that. They don't have a permit to kill it. Now, some of the uh, future uh, solar projects that are coming in are actually having a provision from the Fish and Wildlife Service, Service that allows them to kill one Yuma Clapper Rail. Just, the, you know, just kind of, saying, well, this might happen, we better cover ourselves for it. And by coverage, usually means either they've got to pay into some existing conservation program for the species, or they're going to protect new habitat for it, or some other mitigation provision. So we, we can't just ignore that these are this thing is happening. Another th uh, new th thing that's uh, being uh, observed in these uh, power towers is what's called solar flux. And that's the, the zone of highly concentrated uh, solar rays from the, from the mirrors here at the bottom 
until they get to the, the tower, they're not just, it's not just passive light, it's heat. And as those heat, as that heat accumulates with each of the mirrors, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And so this, these facilities are attracting uh, lots of insects. And with lots of insects comes lots of insect eating birds. And with insect eating birds comes those birds that hunt on birds. So you're finding this whole little microcosm of uh, birds and bats that are flying into this uh, solar flux um, that, again, was not planned. And this is what's happening. Their, their wings are very delicate. Um, they're burning their wings and their tail feathers. And they're, they're either burning up, if, if you, they call them bug zappers now. Because if you look at these things when they're operating, you'll see these little spots of light that just appear and then a trail, like a fiery trail as it goes to the ground. That's a bird getting zapped and falling to the ground. Um, so these things are, are not passive by any means. They're having an impact. Um, this is a peregrine falcon feeding on you know birds that are flying in among the, the uh, uh, mirrors. And this uh, bird was not killed immediately, but you can see its, it's win wings were singed, it couldn't fly, and it eventually died of, of uh, either fatigue or malnutrition. It was found dead at the site. Uh, so again, uh, it's important to, to exam look at the entire picture of what these um, facilities entail. Here's I-15 South uh, coming down into uh, Ivanpah Valley, uh, Prim, this is Prim. Uh, Silver State North is right now, you'll see a small 60, uh, is it 60? Yeah. Uh, Silver State North is uh, 600 acres. It's a, it's a small facility right about here um, that generates three, uh, 300 megawatts. It's photovoltaic. They just got approved to build this new, larger Silver State South uh, project around it um, that virtually cuts off um, tortoise migration capability across this landscape. They did uh, pull the project dis design back a bit to accommodate more of the tortoises in these upland areas. But you can see that the accumulation of all these uh, renewable energy uh, projects, plus the town of Prim, you know, Buffalo Bills Casino and, and Whiskey Peets, um, this is creating a really impermeable barrier for tortoises to get from the southern Ivanpah Valley to the northern Ivanpah Valley. This area here is where Clark County has put about 9,000 of the tortoises removed from uh, development, development projects in the valley. It's called the Large Scale um, Translocation Site. So there's a lot of tortoises out here that you know weren't born here and disoriented, so they're moving. This whole uh, highway has been fenced to prevent uh, tortoise losses along its length. Um, but they're moving, and they're moving through the hills, they're moving through this little valley, and they're coming into here. And now this is a state line uh, solar project which just received um, approval earlier this year. This is the existing solar three power tower um, uh, project. Uh, this is gonna be a new, um, um, state line solar is uh, almost 1,700 acres and will generate 300 megawatts. Um, this Ivanpah facility is 3,500 acres and generates almost 400 megawatts. So this is really turning into kind of a, a lost valley for the desert tortoises in terms of their being able to move from north to south. Yes. Jim, are they using a different technology from the Ivanpah versus the Silver State as well as the new ones because of this new information? Um, not, not so much because of the new information. They had planned on, actually this one was planned to be um, the solar trough technology. I know that's very different than what you just described. Yeah, yeah. So this is, now this is a photovoltaic panels. So it's right. just panels. And all it's doing is it's just, just sending it, exactly. sending down the wires to, exactly. to the power plant. Exactly. So it uses very little water. It uses right. one-tenth the amount of water that the uh, solar trough technology uses. So it's really important to recognize that difference. But it does eat up a lot of acreage still. Right. I, but do they allow, it seems to me as though they should be able to allow the tortoises to be able to bruise that area to a certain extent after they finish their construction because it's out, I've, I've been out to that site. Yeah. And so I've seen how it's been elevated. So yeah, these things are. Yeah. Can allow that to be uh, yeah. somewhat used. Well, the, the, the difficulty in that from the industry perspective is they've got to maintain these panels and so they're running trucks and water trucks and so there's a high, higher likelihood that they would run over a tortoise and get dinged for that. So what they're doing is fencing them, 
putting tortoise fencing at the bottom, taking out all the tortoises, moving them to the exterior of, of the project area, and then the, essentially their heading is gone. But you don't have the same problems you do with the high intensity lights going on up. No, no, this is, but what you do have here is still that, that lake effect. It yeah, still okay. looks, for all intents and purposes, when you're flying over it as a, as a body of water. Those are not movable. No, these are passive. These are just stationary, you know, set at about a 15 or 20 degree angle uh, facing north. Um, so it, it gets, it's more, it's pretty efficient, um, but again, it, it's uh, compared to some other technologies uh, that we'll talk about later. Um, there's other ways to do this. So this is the Silver State Project laid over San Francisco, just to give you an idea of the scale of how big it is. And these, these are not little things. <laughs> And this is a lot of desert to, uh, to blade. And, and in the, the photovoltaic panel projects, um, they typically blade them completely uh, flat. So what are the alternatives then? Distributed generation, energy conservation, degraded sites redevelopment, urban solar farms. Um, and we'll talk about each one of these. Uh, Distributed generation is one that's kind of a no-brainer from, from the environmental standpoint as well as from the user standpoint. It's challenging from the utility standpoint. Utilities like to control everything about energy production and transmission. They can't do that with distributed generation. Um, but it just makes sense in, in a place like Las Vegas or Phoenix or Tucson, why are we not doing this? Germany has more than 30% of, uh, of its energy production from solar and wind. Um, so it's just, just ridiculous that we don't have this. But you know, kudos to uh, um, Mandalay Bay. Um, they're, they're putting in an enormous solar project on all of their warehouses and their flat, kind of their flat buildings. Um, Las Vegas Springs Preserve on their parking lots. I mean, what is more, what is more valuable in Las Vegas than shaded parking? Yeah. Shaded parking that provides electricity. It's, that's what I call a no-brainer. Um, so this is what we should be doing. But the utility companies don't like it because they can't control it. It's, uh, it's, it has um, variable energy production that, that doesn't work well with the way their lines have been set up and the way their, their substations were positioned. So I mean, looking at it from the industry standpoint, I can understand it. But they need to get on this train because it's moving fast. Uh, solar production in the US uh, um, has, has risen dramatically. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. So energy conservation is another thing that's kind of a no-brainer. It's uh, home insulation, smart metering, these new uh, digital meters that you have, can have for your house where you can control when lights come on or off or when your air conditioning comes on or off and what temperature it stays when you're gone from the house. Uh, all of these things um, uh, prevent uh, you know, repairs or upgrades of transmission lines and it's generating, it's keeping the generation of electricity or the maintenance of electricity close to its place of use. Solar net metering is something that uh, is mostly um, associated with rooftop solar, and that's basically where you're f uh, you're turning back your your uh, energy meter. So you're putting panels on your house, and as you generate electricity, it, it turns your meter in reverse. So sometimes you can end up uh, owing nothing on a monthly basis. Sometimes you owe very little. Um, this is one way of of. Uh, incentivizing the, the investment that it takes to build solar panels on your house. And, and they're getting cheaper all the time. Um, so the, the cost of, of amortization, that is how long it takes for you to actually pay off these, these things, has gone down from something like 12 years to now five or six, uh, depending on your, again, on your energy use in your, your home. Um, but, but it really requires the approval and the facilitation by the utility company because they've got to agree to let you turn your meter backwards and also to make up uh, for the difference if you actually produce more energy than you, than you uh, uh, use. Yes? Up until 2035, they're mandated that they have to have at least 35% of the capacity doing that. So they're kind of, by law, they're on the one. Yeah, and that, that was a recent P, uh, public utility Commission uh, ruling that was challenged by the, the utility companies, or th they brought it to court or to the PUC because they wanted to stop 
paying for these. And the PUC, the Public Utility Commission, said no. These people bought these, these um, things to put on the roofs with the expectation that they would pay themselves off. If you stop allowing this, then you've basically broken that promise. So kudos to PUC. And, and the PUC is really um, serve, is your voice in this whole energy discussion. So make sure that you know who your PUC members are, that you know which way they're, they're, um, they're leaning, because they can be um, influenced by a large number of people speaking up and saying, we want this to continue. We want even more of it. So this shows you the, the amount of uh, solar installations. Um, the cost of installation has gone down since 1998 to 2011. The cost per, per uh, watt produced and the number of installations from 1998 has just soared. And if you, this is only until 2011. If you borrowed 2014, it's probably somewhere up in here. It's just enormous how much uh, recently I've seen just around town. Um, uh, so just to summarize then, we've got, in the whole Mojave, we've got 4.5 million acres that qualify for this type of development where you wouldn't be impacting the uh, biological diversity of, of the Mojave Desert. Energy conservation alone more than meets your additional energy needs that have been called for in, in many of these um, uh, urban areas. Parking lots and rooftops, obviously no brainers, but energy companies need to incentivize and support distributed generation and net metering. Uh, in Arizona, the utility company has actually now started to get into the business of rooftop solar. Instead of just sitting back and saying, oh no, don't, don't do this, the sky is falling, they're saying, hey, why don't we just why don't we get in the business of doing it? So we can make up for some of the losses of, uh, of our typical production. Um, so uh, if you want to look uh, this up on, at home, if all this information on renewable energy, uh, kcet.org, KCET News Rewire is a fantastic uh, kind of one-stop shopping that'll explain to you what the difference between solar generates, solar just Sorry, distributed generation, uh, concentrated solar, power tower technology. Um, they'll explain each of these projects to you, and they'll give you the upsides and the downsides. It's really a very, it's a public, uh, uh, publicly funded uh, channel uh, and website. So it's, uh, it's, it's nonpartisan as it gets. So the, the question really is for us, what do we want our desert to look like? Do we want these large, unfragmented blocks of, of desert to serve, to continue to serve future generations for this, you know, this type of beauty, this type of biological diversity? Or do we want it to look like this, which is industrialized landscapes that you know, are really serving as population sinks for many of these species? So really, that's the question before us, and it's up to us, and the energy users, the public land users, to answer that for, for the uh, public agencies. That's it. Thank you. Any other questions? So, do you have any statistics on the courses? Because I was at the Alpha 5 a year and a half ago, and they collected them all, threw them in, and said, we are going to put them all back in. And everybody trained, you know, we're going to try to watch, 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 watch. But have they had any success, or what's happening with one that they were going to relocate back into the facility? Well, they weren't going to put them back in. Relocating, they're relocating them outside the fence line, and they have some. They have some small ones. They collected many more hatchlings and juveniles than they anticipated. They were only permitted initially for I think 35 tortoises in this 3,500 acres. They got that in the first week of, of construction, so they had to stop stop production and and go back and renegotiate a new new permit which allowed them some 135 or 140 tortoises um, they got a lot of hatchlings and eggs that they then created this little care facility much like the desert tortoise conservation center for you those of you who've been there um, with, that are netted prevent you know, ravens from getting and they're supposed to raise these little ones up to you know out of the the walking ravioli stage and get them to where they're <laughs> where they're uh, uh, less edible and more able to protect themselves. So five years, I think they're obligated to raise them. Uh, and and uh, then they'll release them out, either to outside the existing boundary of the project or to another translocation area. And the Fish and Wildlife Service and BLM have just released for public comment, um, actually public comment period closed, um, for uh, new, several new uh, translocation sites um, 
in, on the public lands. And so it might uh, be worth checking out, going to uh, the BLM's website and checking out where these are, are located because you'll be seeing some activity in the future. Yes. I understand we have an issue with wanting to keep the desert, but also the industrial. Is there a way, have, have they looked at ways where they can combine the two together where you can say, right, we still have this protection, but we also have the industrial because, let's face it, people are, you know, people are being produced all the time, right? Yeah. And so obviously our, our, our usage of our land obviously is going to be needed more. So how can we make it habitable for all of us? And, and we have been looking at that? Other yeah, other that, that was really the, the crux of why we invested in this uh, assessment of the entire Mojave. Because we had to have a snapshot. What are we really talking about in terms of how much undeveloped land is out there, how much already degraded habitat is out there? And it's the degraded stuff that we really want to direct that new industrial development towards. The, the former mine sites, the, the fallow ag fields, the, you know, the f old failed um, energy sites. So let's put that new development on those old sites. And not when we find it, and I don't mean to interrupt you, yeah. but when we find a situation like that at the Ivanpah, where, in, because when I drive by that area and I see those bright lights, instantly I recognize the, the bug zappers you're describing. Yeah. I'm, I'm concerned about that. So yeah. how, how is it when we see something like that, that they can, they can deal with that in management and not develop more like that? Well, yeah, there's there's a new project, uh, a similar project planned in Palin area in the Riverside um, Solar Energy Zone, and they're using a lot of the lessons learned from the Ivanpah yeah. towards the, the design and the operation of the Palin project and the provisions that, that the Palin project has to mitigate for. So not only are they looking at it from a desert tourist perspective, but for migratory birds, bats, um, uh, you know, aquatic waterfowl. Um, so they're. I don't know how they fix the, the reflectivity problem. It's exactly. inherent in the technology. You've got to reflect sunlight right, onto right. the. So, but with photovoltaic panels, they're actually now developing glass that's less reflective. Well, that's what I think. Yeah. Because, you know, if you got that reflection, I mean, it just seems to me there's stuff that we can do technology wise. Yeah, I mean, where, we, we, where we can do both. But we haven't been tasked with doing it yet. Yeah, no one's just, saying you have to do that because we didn't know it was a problem before. So now that we know, we can put those regulations, those restrictions in place, those that call for new technologies to be implemented in how these things are designed and operated. So again, it's a learning, a learning process all around. Yes? I was just kind of going to ask about that, because you know, when they do the, uh, the forest, they make the forest people replant the trees and stuff, sure. but they don't make them replant like the Joshua's and the sagebrushes or well, the yeah. There's, there's no way they could keep those plants. I mean, typically on some like uh, some right-of-way projects or power line transmission projects, they'll require that they um, dig up all the cacti and yucca, set them aside in a, a nursery facility until such time as the, the line has been built, and then they're supposed to replace them along the, the right-of-way. Um, but there's no way they could keep them alive for the, the 30 years or 20 years that these projects are supposed to be. Uh, implement. But they can, they are required to go back and do some remediation. I don't know what the, that is, because most likely these sites are not going to just, they're not just pull up the panels and go home. Right. A new technology will most likely replace this technology in the exact same site. So, I mean, energy production is not going away. Fossil fuels are going down in terms of uh, the amount of uh, production. So, these sites are going to be, be used for many, many years. So, you can essentially consider them as gone from the desert tourist perspective. Yes. Well, I know at one point along the I-15, like you were going out towards, um, towards Nipkin, they had at one point just the little trenches under the freeway for the tortoises to go through and yeah. pass on the other side. Are they still making them do it out there? Uh, well, not, not for that project. I mean, that wasn't one of the provisions. That's usually it has to do with any time you um, upgrade or modify an existing roadway. Part of the, the mitigation required is to fence the highway, fence that roadway, and improve the culverts so the tortoises can pass through. So that you'll see, especially on I-15 um, going south um, towards Barstow, um, you'll see the, the tortoise fencing along the, the barbed wire fencing all along the highway. And then at various points, you'll see the tortoise fencing come in to the highway, kind of funnel in. That's channeling the tortoises to a box culvert so they can go through and go to the other side. So maintaining some population connectivity on either side of the highway. Because otherwise the highway is just an insatiable predator. It never gets full, but it constantly kills. Yes? 
couldn't find my pencil one time to write down that website. Kate C E T. Kate, uh, let's see if I can get back to it. Yeah, there it is. KCET.org slash news slash rewire. And uh, just to address the, the last question, here's an example of what, you know, what's done with Joshua Trees on the Wind Project. Uh, they're just bulldozed to the side and probably jumped, uh, just trashed. Oh. That's a lot of old growth Joshua Tree. Did they kind of sold those or, or put them up for sale? Yeah. Could have, should have. <laughs> yeah. They, they only do what they're required to do. If BLM doesn't make them do that, they won't do it. It's not in their business plan. So it's really incumbent upon the public to pay attention to how these, when these projects go through the scoping phase, that is when they're saying, when they're going to the public and saying, this is what we want to do, we want to hear from you, that's when you tell them. Dig up, salvage, cacti and yucca, make provisions for desert tortoise, make sure that migratory birds aren't getting killed by this project, bats aren't being killed by it, and then they have to go back and, and if the pressure's strong enough, they have to go back and kind of retool their, their plan. And then they'll build that into the business plan, and then that goes to you know so many cents per megawatt or kilowatt that they produce. Th they're not bearing the cost. The, the customer will bear the, bear the cost. Yes. Can someone tell me what that George fencing looks like? I'd like to look for it the next time. It's um, you'll see it's about two feet off the ground. It's attached to the existing barbed wire fence, and it's a two inch by one inch mesh. Uh, we, we funded the study that designed that back in 1990 to 95 at the Tortoise Center. One of the projects that was uh, called for and funded was what it makes for an effective tortoise barrier that doesn't kill other animals in the process. So we didn't want to build a mesh that then trapped ground squirrels as they're trying to go back and forth, or that trapped snakes or lizards. And so this, uh, for whatever reason, they tried many different uh, configurations. This was the most effective in keeping tortoises out and keeping the other animals from being killed. It was small enough so they don't try to put their head through, um, but large enough so that if something did get in and wedged, you could turn sideways and scoot out. Uh, so that's why it's two inches high by one inch wide. And so this the fencing was the hardware cloth or the, the mesh was produced, it's now produced in mass for that purpose. Yes? Um, I volunteer out of the spring, so I'm familiar with their solar. And that covers 75 now they've made stations for four electric cars where you can plug in right. and get a full charge like this between two and four hours. And so I thought, well, with all the buildings here in Vegas, if everybody put something on their rooftop. So I looked into it like two years ago. For me, it was going to be $15,000, which is, yeah. I'm not going to live long enough to recover that. So, but I got a call because uh, I filled out some kind of survey, and the guy's coming up to my house tomorrow where they, they look at how much electricity you use, and then they put panels up on your roof for that, and then your bill from the power company usually runs about $30 a month, but he said there's no cost to me for putting the panels up. Is there some kind of... Yeah, it's called it's solar leasing. So actually, they're, they're paying for the installation, they're paying for the materials, but they're using your rooftop to generate electricity that they sell to the power company, and you pay a you know, minimal price. But that's another way of reducing the cost. And that's what it's, it's not a scam. Of course, there may be companies within that that. Yeah. Right. Right. It makes it much much more viable for some people to to put put these things up because you know if you want to make a difference, everybody doing you know doing a little bit uh, can make a difference. So, so if your if your meter is running bad, yeah. it's producing energy. There's a power company that you were hit. Yeah, I don't know if they actually pay. Do you know? Actually, uh, my brother put a solar system in his property about three four years ago obviously more expensive and his total electric bill for the last year was like two hundred dollars and yes his meter does run backwards he gets a credit and a credit, yeah. for it. so his total electric bill for the year and it used to be what two hundred and some dollars a month yeah so now for the year it's, it's roughly it's under two hundred dollars in Nevada no he's in California oh, well, and, he, and where he's at he doesn't get anywhere near the sums that we have here yeah, we have different laws but the unit he has it fix everything. Yeah. You don't have to repair it or nothing. Yeah. It's 
all there. Basically, they're using your rooftop yeah, to make exactly. money. And more right. yeah, power to them, literally. <laughs> 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 Yeah, you don't want to put the power company out of business because on, on cloudy days and rainy days, you want to still be able to turn your lights on. So until we get an effective storage capacity, and until we get good batteries that can actually store that extra electricity, you're not going to be able to just get it from the grid. You're still going to rely on NV Energy or Arizona Power or whatever the case may be. And then we're still using coal. Yeah. Well, they're decommissioning some of the coal plants. So. But they've got to make up for that now with, with something else. You know, that's, that, that, you know, that's all right. You've got to be careful how much you give up. Yeah. Yeah. But just next time you fly over Las Vegas, look at all the warehouse tops and all the, the parking lots that are uncovered. And wow. What a difference that would make. Yeah. So there's no technology to cover um, I don't know. I've heard some talk about nets, but then nets capture, you know, nets can be become, you know, bird nets. Yeah. So it, there's no easy solution yet, but uh, that doesn't mean, you know. They just need to make a little pond site or a little. Yeah, I don't. Site off to the side If they can distinguish between. Yeah. 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 We're we're a smart species sometimes when we're forced to be, but otherwise we do some pretty dumb stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all for uh, your attention. And What an incredible font of knowledge, huh? I just want you to know, Jim has been here since 1990? 1990, now that's when the whole tortoise thing started. And there, we're losing the most amazing resource because we go to these meetings now and the people who are dealing with the tortoise situation have been here five years and three years and maybe eight years or 10 years, but, but then Jim steps up and he says, well, there's this that happened in 94, and you know, and, and we're losing all that. And uh, it's going to be a huge loss, Jim, and we're going to miss you. So I hope you'll come back, you know, and keep up with the tortoises. And would you like to have oh, a, one of our t-shirts? Oh, I was excited to see how these change colors. They are right? cool. Yeah. Yeah. This, so is, cool. this is yeah. large. Is that too large? Oh, no, that's yeah, you have, when you wash it, it'll be regular large. Because <laughs> it's really kind of hulking now. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kathy. And I want to clarify, I'm, I, I'm moving to Phoenix uh, for the most part and working out of San Diego office as well. But I'm also going to be coming back up to Las Vegas twice a month to, to deal with some of the uh, issues up in Beatty, uh, but also to help John out. John, yeah. to clarify, is, is not my assistant or my associate. He is my colleague and my boss now. He's uh, John Sedlocki came from Trout Unlimited, and he uh, is a fantastic uh, new breath of fresh air to the Southern Nevada office. He's going to try and ramp up our Mojave program. Um, so if you have any questions about the Mojave Desert or renewable energy, that's his ball game now. So, up, so we'll you ask me, I'll call Jim and find out. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's the conduit for information from here on out. But um, yeah, by all means, you know, talk with John and, and recognize the face because you'll be seeing it a lot in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Well, that's it for August. I was going to say June. No. <laughs> August. <laughs> Missed a few months there. Um, thank you all for coming. Next month will be our last meeting of the month, but then we have some other things that we're going to be doing throughout the off season that will be fun and exciting. And um, again, if you would be generous, generous enough to slip a few bucks or, or big ones into our donation box, we would appreciate it very much. And we'll see you soon. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.